So welcome to State of the Source. This is the talk on would open source trademarks benefit from a foundation. Um, inspired by the announcement in July of 2020 that Google was creating the Open Usage Commons, which was an entity designed specifically for the ownership of open source trademarks. The Google announcement said specifically that it would not provide services outside the realm of usage such as technical mentorship, community management, project events, or project marketing, strictly on trademarks. So as a trademark lawyer, one working in open source, I found that to be a um, really interesting concept. And um, so read, read up with some interest, and I found some assumptions in the Google announcement that I thought were very interesting and worth sort of further discussion on. Um, so one of them, the first assumption is that an independent foundation can do a better job at managing trademarks than the project itself can. Um, second is that there's uncertainty about how others can use open source trademarks. The third I find the most interesting, which is that trademarks should be available in a free and fair way. And then finally, trademarks of open source projects are used in ways contrary to the open source definition. Um, so uh, these are the, this is what we're gonna talk about and what I'm gonna talk about during this session. A little bit about myself. I am a board member of the Open Source Initiative. I am board certified by the North Carolina State Bar's Board of Legal Specialization in Trademark Law, and I'm required to say that full phrase as a matter to avoid false advertising. Um, I've been writing about uh, ownership of trademarks, specifically about ownership of trademarks, for about 20 years. Uh, first article was in 2001 called Control of Trademarks by the Intellectual Property Holding Company, which is a concept not very different from what we're talking about today. Um, just a side note, um, I have a sling on. It was a self-inflicted injury. Uh, for those of you who know me, you'll not be surprised to know that it was a bicycle accident. So um, this presentation is only, I'm only speaking of US law here. Some of the concepts that I'm gonna talk about are, are very specific to US law. So they may come out differently uh, in other legal jurisdictions. So the first question is, can an independent foundation do a better job at managing trademarks than the project itself can? And um, I'm going to go with, with sometimes yes. <laughs> so, uh, and the reason I say that is trademarks often don't get enough attention from the projects. Um, their true value, I think, is underestimated by the, by the project. So uh, the more attention we get on trademarks and projects, I think the, the better off everyone is going to be. Um, but formalizing ownership of assets is not a new concept. That's what fiscal sponsors do. Uh, Software in the Public Interest, which owns the Debian trademarks, has been around for 23 years. But they generally do more than just um, the trademarks themselves, sort of the distinction that the, that the Google press release was making. Um, the trademark, in my view, as a trademark lawyer, the trademark is often the most valuable and often the only real true asset that that the project owns so paying particular attention to its ownership makes a lot of sense um, and i i think it makes even more sense for open source projects uh, than maybe other types of entities or other types of businesses because of this collaborative nature of the development of the software often uh, a large number of contributors so so i think it makes a lot of sense to um to think about that and and figure out who the owner of the trademark is, who the owner of the trademark is when i talk about trademark ownership one of the things i'm talking about under us law particularly this is one thing that's very different and differs from country to country is um, in the united states a trademark does not have to be registered to be owned a trademark exists whether or not it's registered and it is owned whether or not it is registered in the united states registration is simply the recognition of um, it's a it's a you know government recognition of those trademark rights that already exist so words logos whatever they are they do exist in the absence of registration but the registration formalizes the ownership um, there's also one more point about unregistered trademarks there's a misconception that there has to be some kind of legal entity government recognized entity to own a trademark um, that's not true trademarks can be owned by individuals they can be owned jointly by two or three people uh, they, of course, can be owned by corporations or limited liability companies. They can be owned by partnerships and they can be owned by unincorporated associations. And those last two I mentioned, um, 
those two do not necessarily have formal government recognition. They just come into existence. Um, there's no formation required. They exist because there are people who have combined together to um, for a joint purpose, uh, and those are so, so. Those are also um, recognized entities that can uh, register trademarks, and and this is something that probably we see pretty commonly in open source trademarks. Is it's a partnership or an unincorporated association that actually is the collective unit or the collective, you know, the entity, the, the unitary entity that, that would be the trademark owner. Um, but in thinking about whether or not a trademark should be in a nonprofit, uh, one thing to keep in mind is no matter what the nonprofit is, whether it's um, a more fully formed fiscal sponsor or whether it's just a designed specifically for the trademark, as a nonprofit, there are legal restrictions on how they can dispose of their assets. So if to get the trademark back, there may be some constraints on, on how and when you can get that trademark back and you may have to reimburse the, um, the nonprofit for that trademark. So that's not a function of trademark law, that's a function of um, tax law. So what's very different between trademarks and um, patents or copyrights is the concept that um, the trademark is owned by the person or entity who controls the quality of the goods and services. That is, the ownership and the control are indivisible. You can't have legal ownership in one entity and yet have a different entity um, controlling you know, the quality of, the, of those goods and services available under the, under the trademark. We look and see where is the control, that's who owns it, kind of no matter, no matter what the records say, no matter what the registration says, um, who's, con who's controlling it is the actual owner. So if you try to, so if there is a challenge and you find that the control is in one, is in one place, but the record owner is someone else, then that's going to invalidate that registration. So if, if you are truly assigning your trademark to any, any entity, you are giving up a degree of control with that, um, the degree of control that you have over the quality of your goods and services. Um, but we'll assume for purposes of this discussion that that problem can be solved by smart lawyers, that there will be mechanisms in place to make sure that the trademark will remain valid. And we'll also assume that there are going to be contractual safeguards in place to ensure that the, that the owner will only act in ways consistent with the project's desires, that they're not going to sort of, you know, go off and do whatever they want with the trademark and start licensing it off to all sorts of people in the ways that would be that the project, the project contributors would be unhappy about. So I, I, do, I do think that there's a role for um, an, uh, uh, some kind of owner, someone who's paying attention to the assets of the entity to make sure that they're, um, that they're well taken care of, including the trademark. Um, the next question, is there uncertainty about, hope, about how open source trademarks can be used? And I, I, I give it a qualified no, um, which I'll explain. Which, which is, to my knowledge, there is no trademark right that can interfere with the full use of the software as granted in any open source license. And this is true because trademarks and copyrights are directed at different interests. So they can, they can very um, you know, comfortably coexist with each other. So the copyright is the right to use the code, and the trademark is the right to publicly inform people that you are using the code. So I don't see those as, as necessarily um, one that they necessarily follow each other. So yes, you can use the code, but does that mean that you get to then promote your product as having, as having that code or you know, using the name, using the same name for your code? Um, I, I, don't, I think that there are, that's, that's why I don't see that there's any kind of incongruity between copyright and trademark. Um, if when the trademark owner tries to overreach, tries to claim that trademark um, allows them to require something that isn't required, there are legal doctrines in place that protect the user, that allow the user to continue to use the trademark. Um, I don't want to, I'm not going to go into them right now. If you have some particular questions um, where you see that what the statement I've, I've made is not true, um, put it in the chat and hopefully we'll have some time at the end to talk about it. Um, so largely what I see is, is a misunderstanding about what the law actually permits and doesn't permit. 
a trademark laws is a delicately balanced system for, with rules for when you may, when you may and may not use others trade others trade others trademarks and when i when i look at this system in any um when i look at the system and use of open source trademarks it all makes sense it all fits to me about when when you someone must be allowed to use a trademark when they can use a trademark when they may use the trademark when they shouldn't be allowed to use the trademark all of that um, there is legal doctrine for all of that but you're going to have um bad or even well-intentioned actors who try to claim that under the color of trademark that because of the trademark that some lawful behavior is prohibited. And I'm gonna go into that a little bit later. So trademark guidelines, um, I think play an important role to clear up uncertainty. So as with any law, there is, you know, um, haze at the edges. There's not bright lines necessarily. And so trademark guidelines are very useful to, for the trademark owner to state what they believe is a lawful use. Like if you use this, the trademark this way, we're perfectly good with that. We won't, we won't bother you with that. We think that that's lawful and you're allowed to, use that, to do that. I also believe that trademark guidelines um, have to be customized to the owner's particular needs. Every project has different products, different interests. So just in terms of, of the software itself, um, Mozilla has made the, the choice that uh, it will only allow the Firefox browser to be called Firefox if, if, it's, the, if it's their build of the binary. And that, it, that is, I believe, a legitimate choice to make because the trademark is your quality assurance. Um, and so it's only fair for the trademark owner to say, this is what I'm willing to, to have bear my good name and you know, draw the line where they, where they, wouldn't, where they don't want to allow that. Um, LibreOffice takes a more, somewhat more liberal view, and they allow some in their trademark guidelines. You'll you'll find some kinds of modifications. You can um, reskin, you can change languages, and you can still call it LibreOffice. But you know they're fairly modest changes um, to still call it LibreOffice. Kubernetes takes a different uh, angle. They have conformance testing, so as long as you pass the test, you can call it Kubernetes. Um, it's very similar to the way that Java, uh, Java does it. So, you know, three very different ways of approaching when someone gets to use the trademark and all, you know, well described in, in, their, in their documentation. Another thing that trademark guidelines can do is grant licenses in trademark, it, it licenses to the trademark. So to say what would otherwise be an infringing use maybe to make swag with a trademark, you can say, you know, we're granting you a license to make swag, go ahead. Or, or very commonly it will be um, to have a meetup. Or and sometimes, sometimes people allow conferences to someone to come along and create a conference um, and, you know, sort of have an event and others will be much more, much more um, circumspect and when they're going to allow someone to do that. So these are all choices that can, that, that, that should be, I believe everybody should have trademark guidelines and that those trademark guidelines can be very clear to set out what the owner believes is a lawful use and what kind of licenses that they might be willing to grant. So, but, but this was about, you know, an announcement for an organization. So um, none of this relates really to what a tra how, how these problems are going to be fixed by a, a trademark holding company, but anyway. Um, the next question, should trademarks be available in a free and fair way? So this, this I just found the most interesting question, that, you know, the quotes on, on free and fair. Um, what does that mean? What does free and fair mean with respect to trademarks? So is there or should there be some right to use a mark beyond its lawful use? Now, you know, we'll get to a minute to... to um, people who try to overreach, but it's just talking about lawful use. Is, is should someone get to use a use a mark in a way that's not only lawful but more than what you know the, the, some some use that the trademark owner might otherwise want to tolerate? I frame it this way: is should someone other than the project be allowed to exploit the marketing value of the mark? That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the public-facing use of a trademark. And should that be allowed even when they have modified the software and e modified it perhaps even beyond what the project would consider authentic code? So it's, you know, most products, 
would not want their do not want their product altered. Um, of course, we live in a world where that's what happens in this in this world. But at what point is it appropriate for the for the trademark owner to say, "But you can you can't call it that anymore. You can't you can change the code, but you can't call it." you know, foo anymore. I don't, I don't have any answers for that question. And I would love to have that discussion with some people. I mean, you know, should, should everybody be able, should you be able to advertise um, that you're using, you know, putting on your web page, this is built on, you know, built on Linux. There's an advert, there, there's a, it's a marketing value to saying that is who should accrue the value of that? Should it be Linux who does that? Who gets that, or should it be the product that's built on Linux? Is there should they get a free ride on that because it's an open source project? I don't know. I think that's I think that's to me that's sort of the next gen question on this. But again, you know, again, I'm not sure how a trademark holding company is is the you know is the gonna. I don't think trademark ownership necessarily answers these questions. And then finally, we get to. Um, are trademarks of open source projects used in ways contrary to the open source definition? And some will try. Um, so, you know, the failure to grant a trademark license per se is not contrary to the OSD. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, many open source licenses expressly state that, there, that no trademark license is granted, and those are routinely approved. There are many open source licenses. Um, as I said before, this bullet point made it on two slides. I thought it was so important. It's a delicately balanced system with rules that you, may, with rules for what you may or may not use when you may or may not use others' trademarks. But what about those who overextend their trademark rights? So they claim, so they have said, for example, that you may not use their trademark in a way that would be lawful. That's not a trademark infringement for you to use it that way. So that claim, if it's not an infringement, the only way they can enforce that right is under contract law, if somehow you have agreed with them that you will not do that. So why do you have to listen to them? So where are these found? These are found in trademark guidelines. Are those enforceable contracts? Um, I take the position that they aren't, I never, I take the position that they, that they likely are, would not be considered an enforceable contract. To have a contract, you have to have mutual assent. I have to be able to point to something that says this is where you agreed that you were going to abide by this restriction. Um, and you know, having a web page, having something on a web page, you can't prove that I saw the web page. I didn't click a box that said that I agreed to the web page. So um, you know, you're not, you, you're uh, you, you may not have um, it has a this is sort of a fundamental problem that they can't prove that you agreed to that, and otherwise your use is lawful. So that there's no claim. Um, if they um, if they do say, for example, though, that they said, well, um, you get to use our software uh, on, under the copyright license. And in addition, you have to agree. You know, your your um, use of the software is conditioned. Your copyright license is conditioned on also agreeing to our trademark license or to our trademark guidelines. That would certainly be under the GPL. That would be an, an additional restriction. Um, that would not be accepted as a as a further you know further restriction under the GPL, depending on what was in those guidelines, uh, would not you know to the extent that those guidelines are inconsistent with the OSD, then you know that combination would be considered um, contrary to the OSD. For example, that restriction was. Um, but you know you can you can use the software, but um, but under the trademark license, but our trademark license says that you're not allowed to commercialize the software. Well, you know that's you can't backdoor um, into the you know a, a, a open source software by adding an additional restriction, but in a different way. So uh, again, it's just not um, it, these are attempts to sort of hack restrictions using trademark law, but using it in, in an inappropriate way. But you know, still not sure what the what what an organization how an organization is going to solve this problem. Um, so, at the end of the day, my opinion is that a project may benefit from aligning with a formally organized entity, um, but an entity owning the trademark only the trademark and nothing else is a higher risk type of entity in terms of trademark ownership. So, those are I think those are something that you have to consider. Um, when you're looking, you're looking at these different entities to see what they may have to offer. 
Uh, I believe that every every open source project and every trademark policy should exp should state expressly that all lawful uses of the trademark are allowed. Um, I think that solves a, that solves about ninety five percent of the problems right there. And then you you know get into an argument over what's lawful, but that's sort of the fringe cases. And then every project should have the freedom to determine for itself what uses requiring a license it will allow. So I don't, I'm, I'm very wary of sort of a one size fits all, um, you know, trademark, trademark, uh, you know, dictate uh, that tries to solve all the problems. I think these are much more granular issues that each project um, has to has to think about for themselves on what they want to do. So. Uh, discussion. We'll take a look at the questions that you have in the chat. Also, I have a couple slides of resources here. If you're interested in those, we'll be able to distribute the slides, but um, we'll go live now. It's great to see everybody. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, this is a really fun exercise for me and I hope you also enjoyed it. So uh, first I'm just going to answer one of the questions in the um, shared notes which was which is the question is what does control mean um yeah you so i've carefully avoided talking about that it's a it's a kind of a bigger question and it's and it's very context specific so for example if i um if the trademark message is i created this product then the message the expect the, the control that you have to exert is you you know you decided what that product was what what qualities it has what manufacturing um, standards it has that can be a very high level of sort of input uh, a decision making on um, on you know what the product is going to be or how it's going to come out of the service um, on the other end of the spectrum <clears throat> excuse me on the other end of the spectrum you know if you produce if you produce if you order mugs from um, a vendor to hand out at a conference um, in theory, if you you know for your trademark, you could have a trademark on mugs, but and but your the control of the mark might be limited to do just selecting a good vendor for the mugs. You you know selected someone okay. reputable. Um, it, this, so when these cases come up about who is controlling the mark, there um, and I actually have an article, a whole article just on that on that topic. Um, there are a lot of factors that uh, that courts will consider and look at. There's a, there's about seven or eight factors they look at. So control is kind kind of, it's the shortcut term for it, but it's a little more expansive than that, and it can range from very you know very very high degree of responsibility to you know lower degree depending on what the product is. Um, and the second, the second question examples of specific projects that have overextensions on their trademark, trademark guidelines. I, um, I none come off the top of my head. I would have to sort of look into it. And there might be some people in the in the room who have some knowledge. I know people have given me examples, and um, but I just I don't want to make that accusation without having looked up the trademark guideline itself to see what, whether or not I think it's an overreach, but I certainly have seen the overreach in trademark guidelines. Um, can, can control be delegated and then revoked like from a project to a legal entity, but then taken back? Um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm kind of, it's that question is not framed in a way that either my brain works or the law works. So I'll, I'm kind of going to, going to reframe it a little bit. Um, I, the, what happens is it, it the courts look at it as a moment in time. So I have a trademark. I'm asserting my trademark rights. The defendant comes along and challenges it and says, "No, you're not the owner because because you're not controlling the mark." So so the case law is sort of a snapshot in time. It, it isn't a question of um, it isn't a question of sort of paper or you know agreements. It's a question of who's doing the work, who's doing the heavy lifting on this. Um, one thing, uh, there's also, um, I also just want to make sure that there's sort of not, um, I don't want to, I don't know if there might be some sort of uh, confusion or blurriness about control versus testing. So control is, I've set up the test parameters, say, say we have a, a testing model for control that you get to call it that if you, you know, the Java model, you get to use the Java trademark if you pass the TCK. Um, they, you know, Java, you, they, you self-certify, I mean, so, so people self-certify, I believe under, under Java, they self-certify that they pass the test. Um, but nevertheless, um, 
Oracle would still own the trademark because they're the ones who set up the testing parameters. They're the ones who said, this is what the project, th this is what the software has to be able to do in order for you to call it Java. So I don't want to, I don't want to um, confuse um, a testing or a certification program with control of the trademark. Those, you know, you could outsource the certification to someone else and say, you know, you get to, you know, go to this person, they'll certify, you know, they'll test your software. Um, if it passes, then you get to use the trademark. So, you know, so that's, but that's, but it's still, you know, the, it's still the software, you know, there's the control of the, the decision on what makes that software uh, able to, to have that name is still in the different entity. Um, so I hope that, I hope that clarified question three. And if, if not, um, I'd be happy to take another stab. Um, how do, do how does how do cross jurisdiction rules apply here? Perhaps is the control in the bulk is I don't know, let's see. I'm not sure what the bulk what the bulk means. And also, um, as I said, this is as I said at the outset, this is this is very U.S. specific. Um, in other countries, other countries, and I, I don't want to speak too much about other countries because I'm not lawyers in other countries, but. Um, in some countries of registration, there are two basic schemes for, for trademark registration. The one I described in the U.S., which is based on use, where the registration is a recognition of already use-based rights or, you know, yeah, use-based rights. Other countries, the registration is the legal grant of the right to use a trademark. So two very different schemes. So in those, in those, in those jurisdictions where the owning a trademark registration is a legal grant, they're going to look at this question of ownership quite, quite differently from how we would look at it in, in other countries. That said, there are nevertheless, I, I have seen cases, for example, in the EU, which is a you know registration-based system where, never, well, it's kind of a, I, I stated like two, dif two different things. It's actually just a continuum. So they get all kind of mushed together and blurry between the countries. So in the EU, it is a registration-based system, but they also give some deference to um, non-registered prior rights in certain cases. And I have seen challenges under EU law on whether or not it was the rightful person who registered the trademark. So you can challenge, you, you may be able to challenge ownership. I'm not sure how much the control plays in other countries, but that's, but it is, you know, the concept I'm talking about is very, it is US specific um, and, so I, I don't want to speculate on what other countries might say. Um, let's see. And let's see, perhaps the country, yeah. Uh, legal systems are different. Yeah, so I, I, if I have not answered um, question four to what you believe is my full ability to answer question four, then please um, type some other questions. I'd be happy to. Oh, does WIPO, does WIPO have impact here? So um, trademark... Kind of yes and yes and no, depending on what what you mean by WIPO. So WIPO um, is a is an NGO that administers a number of trademark treaties, and so so trademarks are territorial for the most part. They're ter they're they are uh, uh, every every country has its own trademark laws. There are, however, also a number of trademark treaties that do harmonize some aspects of trademark law around the world for those um, for those uh, those countries that have signed on to the treaty. Um, I don't actually believe that this, I have, now I have not, I can't think of any way that any of those treaties, um, that there's any kind of um, universal requirement about trademark ownership vis-a-vis -vis control in any of those treaties. Yes, thanks everybody. It was really great. I was so glad to, so glad to see everybody. I wish we could see each other in person, but we'll do this.